What's going on guys? Welcome back to another video. So I'm actually at my boy's uh, Ezekiel's shop here in Fremont, California. It's a Monday morning. I actually took the day off to work on the Porsche. I guess that's my idea of a vacation is to keep working on stuff like cars. Uh, Ezekiel, if you want to turn the camera on your face and uh, say what's up. Hello. <laughs> and uh, follow him on Instagram and YouTube. I'll plug that below. So if you come over here to the table, I'll go over all the goodies that we're going to be throwing onto the car. And wait, don't leave the video just yet. I know we're not doing like a flamethrower kit or we're not installing like a turbo kit into the glove box or anything like that. But these are very important parts. The goal of this is to dial in the Porsche. I think I said previously in the previous video that the Porsche does not need a lot of parts, but needs some very specific ones. And these are it. Uh, one of the main reasons why I haven't been driving the car that much is because I haven't gotten these parts onto it to dial it in. I mean, the ride height is kind of whack. We'll go over that in a second. So these are, these are you know, critical but not flashy parts, but that's a goal. That's the uh, Porsche life, you know what I mean? So anyway, go ahead and go over these parts. Uh, starting from left to right on this table, we have some new old stock Porsche Crest uh, center caps for the wheels. And then I also have some MSI wheel studs and lug nuts. These are NASCAR, you know, great, I guess, hardware. They actually use this in NASCAR and also IMSA. Um, previously I used ARP, but these I think are the real deal. I think these are a notch above ARP studs because ultimately I want to space out the wheels a little bit more. So we got to run extended studs anyway. And then we're going to be doing a bunch of oil stuff. Um, so I have two Porsche oil filters right here. Uh, so of course the car does need two oil filters and also needs, as you can see over here, 11 quarts of oil for the engine. And we also have four quarts of Amsoil 7590. Uh, transaxle and manual transmission gear loop that we're going to be putting into the car. So that's all the oil stuff. I also have a OEM oil filter wrench to make the process a little bit easier. Whole bunch of drain plugs and gaskets to make that process go well as well. And now if you come over here and zoom into this, this is my Elephant Racing bump steer correction tie rod kit. And we'll go over that in more detail once we get into it. And also some Roth Sports uh, polyurethane steering rack bushings to firm things up up front. Hey, do you do this for all your cars that you work on or just uh... Every single one. Ooh. into the bay. So Ezekiel, what do you think about the activities we have lined up for today? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks again for the opportunity. You always have something cool for me to work on. And uh, yeah, always a privilege, man. All these cars you always have are really My special. My friend, the so. privilege is all mine. <laughs> so yeah, so far I like it a lot. It sounds like a Porsche should. The, the doors and stuff open like, you know, a German car should. It's like size, right? We just talked about how like modern cars are all fat and bloated. Right. Yeah, man, I like it a lot. Yeah, it fits in here real nice huh, in terms of the sizing. Yeah. If you pull up like a modern like 992 or 991 here, it's so much bigger of a car. The car right now is too high. As you can see, the front's not bad in terms of the wheel gap, but the back over there is a little bit too high. It's not totally even in my opinion anyway. Look at that gap. Ezekiel, what do you think about that gap? No bueno. That's too much. So the first step is to lower the car, of course, get things even. And then after that, we are going to bust out the scales and give it a proper corner balancing. Finally, I am corner balancing a car on corner balance. What you want to do is you want to torque this sucker. Oh, it doesn't fit. It's not really on there, dude. Okay, now it's on there real nice. Oh, here we go, 40 foot pounds. Wow, that worked out brilliant. Right. Tip of the day, get yourself one of these uh, crow's foot things. So these two things here are the R tubes, or I guess the heat exchanger, I don't know, exhaust tube things or whatever. Took those off to get more clearance for the oil change. Put them into this nice parts washer. Gonna give them a rinse. Put them back on. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to take off the first oil filter, which is way up here. Uh, typically, you have to take off this line, but luckily, Ezekiel the Sorcerer was able to fit this wrench on it because typically you can't fit like the uh, the OEM. Too. Yeah, like the OEM one, like over here. Normally, this is the oil filter wrench that's supposed to go on it, but of course, can't can't get that in there. So that's just a universal oil filter removal tool. It's got two jaws on it. I'll show you guys. And I was able to just easily finesse this guy up in there. Nice. So I could feel right there it's loose. I'm gonna take this back off and then do the rest by hand, so. Yeah, that's way easier than taking this pipe off. Yeah. Messing with that connection every single time you do an oil change. All right, it is lunchtime. I'm gonna jet out real quick and go get some food. As you guys can see, this is not fog. All this like weirdness in the air, that is from the uh, wildfires we're getting here in Northern California. Kind of sucks. It smells like ash. But anyway, I'm taking this thing. This uh, I don't even know what this thing is. A Toyota wagon. All right, let's uh, let's go. Ooh. Hmm. Sorts up nice. Look at that thing. It feels like a truck in here. <laughs> Damn. It's gutted too. Old school. Hell yeah. What the? Man, look at this throw. This is like click, click, click. Oh, wow. Amazing. Dude, this wheel is burning the flesh off my hands. Couple creaks, uh, you know? Couple rattles, but it's not bad. Third. Check out this uh, attack gauge. You can set the red line. Right now it's set to 5,000. Let me just go ahead and fix this thing real quick. You know, bump this thing up to like maybe, I don't know. 8K, there we go, much better. So this is what you get when the other restaurants are closed. So while I was out getting the burrito, Ezekiel already finished the oil change. Well, not the oil change itself, but like removing the filters and draining the oil from the big sump, which is uh, behind this passenger side quarter just right up in there so you gotta like get this little access panel off and then you gotta take the wheel liner off and you can just drain it from here and take out the oil filter that's also in here All right, we've been doing a pretty poor job in terms of filming this, but we finished the oil change back here. Train fluid is all done. Engine stuff is all done. Uh, put this under tray thing back on. Gonna do the engine one in a second. We have the Elephant Racing bump steer tie rod at the top, stock at the bottom. We're removing the passenger side tie rod right now. That's There's a little spacer. donut spacer that needs to go on there. That needs to stay on there. Yeah. And you have to throw that in with the new one as well. Yeah. So in order to do all this, you have to completely Take the knuckle off. Take the knuckle off. Take the strut off too, because this is in the way of the tie rod coming out. Yeah. So you gotta take all that apart. Yeah. So then you end up with something that looks like this. Look at this nightmare in the front suspension. This is what it looks like to install those um, bump steer tie rods. So Ezekiel, you wanna walk us through what this big ass tube is? Tie rod remover and installer tool. Because on the end of that tie rod, it's too skinny. You physically cannot fit a wrench on there. So this thing actually slips onto what, the end of that tie rod to tighten it down? Yeah. So that tool has a couple fittings and uh, the fitting slips onto there and the tube over it. If you look at the thickness of this, you can see that wrench is gonna be, plus we have a spacer there, so you physically cannot fit a wrench on there. Right, so you need that special tool. So I need this and then this- This allows to the, you to torque it down too. Yeah, so 55 foot pounds, we're gonna hold one end of the rack cause we don't wanna twist the rack and then we'll torque the tube. All right, cool, man, let's do it. Those tie rods were a lot of work. We thought it would take like two hours at most. It took like all afternoon. It's uh, like 4.30 PM. So it's been basically the whole day just doing the oil change, training stuff. Got these tie rods in finally. Now we're working on taking out the calipers so we can take off the rotor. 
get access to the hub and hopefully change out these studs. All right, so we got the extended studs installed on both sides actually. These are indeed the MSI, you know, NASCAR studs. Got the bull nose, got the nice, you know, chrome molly, I believe, construction, the Teflon and molly coating. Um, here's a look at the stock stud actually compared to the new ones. All right, the bad news, however, I don't think we're gonna have time to do the back. I mean, we took off the rotor back here, but there's no room, there's no access room to get the studs out unless you take the entire uh, e-brake shoe assembly off. And uh, you know, it's probably gonna take some time, huh? We're not gonna do that today. And we still got a lot more to do. We still gotta corner balance this thing and uh, get the ride height fine-tuned, so. Yeah, why don't we do that? As you guys can probably see, it's uh, nighttime. We've been here all day. It's a grueling thing, man. Um, didn't finish completely. We did not get a chance to corner balance the car. Just completely ran out of time. Didn't get a chance to put the rear studs in. We'll do that next time. But we did finish everything else. Basically warming up the car right now to double check the oil level. Still need to go do an alignment tomorrow and then maybe figure out the corner balancing then. Or just at least get the right height set. Um, oh my God, dude, I'm like beat. <laughs> I don't even know what time it's like, what is it, 9 p.m. or something? And then I got here at like 9, so it was like 12 hours. Dude, German cars, not easy to work on. Let me just put it that way. But you tired? Am I tired? Uh, I'm always a little bit tired. Not a big deal. But you're an animal, dude. Like, yeah. You just go at a consistent pace. Yeah, pretty much. You don't eat either. Yeah, that's kind of bad. That's crazy. How do you how do, you do this? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, this is the type of pace that you're used to keeping up with, huh? Day in, day out. Yeah, I still get it. I was gonna say I still have a meeting after this, so. Dude, I'm about to go home and pass out, take a shower, but you got a meeting to go to. You gotta do this again the next day and the day after, huh? Yeah. Dude, kudos to you, brother. Yeah, thanks again for the opportunity, Eric. No, thank you. Seriously, like that was. Uh, I didn't expect it today to be that hard. Like, I thought it was just gonna be basic stuff. It was basic stuff, but still. All right. Later. Peace. Okay, so I'm gonna finish off this video in voiceover mode because I wanna keep this part brief and summarize. And of course, just watching alignment and corn balance and stuff, that's not that interesting of a video. So I want to just highlight the salient points. So basically the very next morning, I drove the car over to an appointment I had at Roger Krauss Racing in Castro Valley, California. And this is where Brandon, the owner's son, actually helped me uh, finish off the corn balancing. So Ezekiel and I did get a chance to lower the ride height the previous night, but we didn't have any time, of course, to really dial things in. So it was still pretty off but we still got it to a good baseline and then finishing off the corner balance was done really quickly. I was actually pretty surprised. And this is a testament to how well the 993 chassis actually cross weights out. So here are the measurements of the car in its before state when we brought it in. As you can see, the corner weights are pretty off. The left front to right rear cross weight was about 53% while the right front to left rear cross weight was about 47%. So for those who don't know how corner balancing works, essentially you sit in the driver's seat as I did, and then you put the car onto scales on each of the corners, and you go around and you lower or you raise each of the corners right height accordingly to get the weight even. So here are the final numbers that we ended up at, and you can see that the numbers went down quite a bit, which was a good thing because of course, aesthetically, I also wanted to close the wheel gap. And I was actually kind of nervous because the night before, we maxed out the driver's side rear strut. It did not have any more uh, turns to go for the collars, but luckily that ended up being perfect. We actually left that corner completely alone and just tweaked the other three. So if you look at these numbers now, the left front to right rear cross weight is at 50%. And then the right front to left rear cross rate was at, you know, 49.97%, basically 50%. So that is dialed in. And yes, just touching on the namesake of this channel, corn balancing itself is a pretty, I guess, advanced move. Not many people do it, but after having been through this, in the ideal world, I can definitely say that corn balancing would be mandatory. Anytime you change the right height of your car, if you install coilovers, if you lower it, you're messing up the corner weights of the car probably by a lot, maybe even more than you think. And if you want to really truly get a good alignment, you have to corner balance the car. That's just the nature of how things work. So I was super stoked about that and just driving the car afterwards, not to be cheesy, but honestly felt so much more balanced. Um, and also in a combination of the tie rods that we installed, which had Aurora bearings at the end of it, the spherical bearings and the polyurethane steering rack, that also did help to stiffen up the you know front end feel, of course, the steering feel. But one quick thing to end it is actually gonna be a question for you guys. Some of you guys have probably already noticed from the undercarriage shots just how dirty and black things kind of look. 
That is not oil, that is not dirt, that is not grease. It's like some weird underliner or protectant type spray. Like some ape literally looked like he just spray bombed the entire bottom side of the car. And I feel like that type of undercoating is pretty unnecessary because everything under there is aluminum and I'm not driving the thing in snow. And I would love to find an easy way to take all that stuff off. But just, you know, using degreaser is not gonna work. It's not gonna be aggressive enough. So if you guys have any tips around that stuff, would love to know in the comments below. But anyway, that concludes this video. Thank you for watching, especially if you stuck all the way to the end like this. And I'll see you guys next time here on Corn Balanced. Peace.